Okay, so uh, welcome back. I thought I would start this uh, second uh, lecture by sharing a joke that I made up recently. Um, what does the, uh, how does a person feel uh, when they've dropped their toothpaste? And the answer is crestfallen. Okay, so uh, you can help me kind of integrate that into into our discussion for today. Um, so now we're going to talk about Sharon Roos's uh, chapter on chronic sorrow, which um, when I put it right next to Therese Rando's chapter on anticipatory grief might be a little bit hard um, to disentangle. So uh, because both of them have to do with grief that kind of steps into life. So it doesn't just stay at death, but it comes into the present. Um, and again, I want you to, to learn this uh, type of grief because I want you to be very um, attuned to it in your pastoral ministry. I want you to have your ears and eyes open for this particular kind of grief. So uh, Sharon Roos um, is building on the work of Simon Olshansky, who first developed the concept of chronic sorrow. Um, and chronic sorrow is the ongoing, never-ending grief that comes from a loss of, uh, related to oneself or others. Um, but what the characteristic of chronic sorrow is, it is really about protra uh, protracted or endless uncertainty. Um, and I was thinking about uh, the kinds of losses that are talked about in Sharon Bruce's helpful chapter. And a lot of them have to do with things that are kind of losses in plain sight. So the losses associated with having uh, a child with a disability, and um, she uses some older language for that experience of disability, um, including the term retardation, which isn't used any longer. But uh, what Sharon Bruce wants to draw our attention to is that um, some forms of loss create these ongoing uncertainties, and they per kind of create a, a crisis of profound alienation. So she mentions some kinds of losses that are chronic sorrow, and they have to do with the losses of uh, parents who have children with disabilities, uh, the losses of mothers who relinquish uh, their children, um, if you want to take a look at this, a book about this subject, you might want to look at a book on adoption called Adoptees Come of Age by Ronald Nidham that talks about that long-term relinquishment adoption. Um, she uh, shares some other examples. Um, someone, who has, someone who has a sibling with severe mental illness uh, might find themselves in a situation of chronic sorrow where they're not completely able to grieve and let go, and they find that um, the new kind of relationship affects all different parts of their life. Um, so what's, what's, what's distinctive about chronic sorrow? It's a lack of closure, and um, it tends to create a kind of uh, what-ifs. Um, she brings in the example of uh, people who are lost in a uh, military uh, situation where they don't find the body. Um, she says, in those situations, persons who remain protractedly or endlessly uncertain about the whereabouts, conditions, and existence of an absent or missing loved one. So you might picture someone whose um, child runs away uh, and just is no longer able to be found, um, creates a kind of bereavement that, um, that can't be grieved in conventional ways. It's chronic sorrow. Uh, decades go by and there's no answers and there's a kind of pervasive, profound, and reoccurring, recurring grief. Um, so it, it's totally different from a loss where there's an endpoint, um, like the kinds of losses we've been talking about, a terminal diagnosis where there's an endpoint. Uh, chronic sorrow is a, a loss that kind of continues, particularly in fantasy. Um, Roos talks about how people who face chronic loss they think about what could have been different. They fantasize um, other potential scenarios, other kinds of lives. I don't know if you remember the story, um, the rabbit cake example 
where the girl, there was some confusion around the death of her mother. And she went back and she tried to find out um, details about her mother's loss, but the counselor called it denial. Um, she was trying to kind of investigate the circumstances around her mother's loss, which the counselor interpreted it as denial. Um, so chronic sorrow is kind of a, a meaning-making emergency. Um, oh, and by the way, for this uh, the time of coronavirus, I thought it was important that um, chronic sorrow also pertains to the effects of those who cope with the stress of a prolonged or inde indeterminate period of waiting. So uh, the coronavirus waiting period might be considered a form of chronic sorrow, uh, something where you feel kind of powerless, but you're trying to cope with a period of long-term waiting. Um, so she talks about kind of chronic sorrow creating intellectual acknowledgement, but emotional failure to acknowledge um, until you go back and you and you kind of regrieve. Um, so what happens in chronic sorrow is that the mind is overwhelmed and can't cope with the enormity of a tragedy um, and then just tries to put on a best face. Um, So I think uh, one of the things that stands out to me about these examples of chronic sorrow are they also contain an element of the future or hoped for self. Um, so the examples of loss around disability or mental illness, a sibling with a serious mental illness, um, there's a kind of the process of healing involves acknowledging the chronicity of the loss and it, it, it involves a kind of wishing things were different in fantasy. So keeping alive some aspect of a person um, who is never maybe alive in the way that some, they might be in the minds uh, or hopes and dreams of their loved ones. And this might contrast with the disability perspective, which really says uh, we want to try to honor everyone who's differently abled. Um, and we don't stigmatize them. But instead, this approach says that actually experiences of illness, experiences of mental illness and disability often create situations where people have a lot of dashed hopes and dreams. And those can be really helpful to know about pastorally and to name. Um, and instead of asking someone to put on a best face, um, kind of grappling with these losses. Um, so... Uh, the, one of the things that I really like about this article is that Ruth says it's unrealistic to expect acceptance of um, chronic or tragic catastrophic damage. So uh, we learn to accept the other, but not the forces that harm them. Um, and we don't expect catharsis. Um, so what I really like is that uh, Ruth wants to keep this form of loss open, in a sense, to the future by saying, um, we need to witness this. Um, there's profound, uh, there's a profound chronic sorrow in some people's life that doesn't go away. And in, in um, even naming it, we don't expect it to go away. But there is a way in which pastoral care can respond to um, chronic sorrow and find out the kinds of scripts that are hidden in the storyline a person tells about chronic sorrow. So I thought it was really interesting that we were talking about this um, after having engaged the bedrooms of the fallen um, and your powerful work on those military rooms. I wonder if you've thought about how it might change um, people's experience um, if it wasn't there wasn't an endpoint in those particular military losses but it was kind of a situation where there was a missing in action or a body hadn't been found. Um, I think those kinds of situations create a new kind of um, distressing and recurring grief. Um, sometimes what helps people grieve is a, a cultural place to memorialize someone, even if the loss isn't finished. Um, sometimes what helps is just simply pastoral attention to the grief, calling it a chronic sorrow, um, naming some of those fantasies, those hope for dreams. Um, I think uh, the chaplain Robert Persky was one of the first to do work with the, uh, uh, people with developmental disabilities as a chaplain. 
And what he found in his work was that often um, the parents of persons with developmental disabilities had a kind of unfinished lament that needed to be named in pastoral care. And um, that reminds me a little bit of Roos's concept of, uh, of chronic sorrow. So um, we, you might be thinking again, can you think to yourself, what are the distinctive aspects of chronic sorrow? How can I tell if I'm witnessing that versus another kind of anticipatory grief? Um, how would I distinguish chronic sorrow from dementia or anticipatory grief or something like that? What, what sets apart chronic sorrow is um, the chronic sorrow is a loss without closure that creates a deeply distressing grief. Um, and in that grief, there's a failure to mourn um, in a way that kind of leads to acceptance. Um, but instead, the mourning kind of remains open. Um, and it's not ex uh, you don't expect there to be a really nice resolution. Often in chronic sorrow, uh, what's being grieved is also the potential future of a person. So um, you might be grieving a certain kind of future for you or your loved one, um, say free from disability or uh, uh, no longer facing the, the grief of at, uh, being missing in action or having uh, adoption relinquishment. Um, and so in pastoral care, what needs to happen then is there needs to be a space to allow chronic sorrow to continue while naming some of those fantasies, naming those what-ifs, naming the questions that often come along with the experience of chronic sorrow. Um, so chronic sorrow is uh, distinguished by uncertainty, and there's an element of fantasy. And chronic sorrow can relate to both one's, oneself or one's loved one, or it can be parts of both. Uh, it could be one's future self as a healthy person that one's grieving. It could be um, the future uh, well-being of a loved one with a uh, disability um, like Parkinson's or uh, a disability like um, uh, yeah, any range of cognitive or de uh, developmental disabilities where there's a loss of a certain kind of future or a hoped for future. So that's what, that's what distinguishes uh, Roos's notion of chronic sorrow. Okay, and you might be thinking in your pastoral imagination, um, how can you raise the issue of chronic sorrow in your care? Um, and this might involve reaching out and naming some things that you see and asking about some of the potential range of reactions with uh, Roos's uh, psychological framework in mind, but putting it in a pastoral framework. Um, you might also think about what particular theological doctrines or imaginations are helpful when it comes to chronic sorrow. Um, do the Psalms of Lament help? Maybe especially Psalm 13 and 88 that don't provide a nice resolution at the end. Um, and also, uh, is there a way in which there might be doctrines of the faith, um, say the, the re reform notion that in life and in death we belong to God, um, that might be especially comforting or important during the experience of chronic sorrow. So you might see how you think you could interpret uh, those doctrines or themes of the faith in ways that still remain faithful or realistic to the experience of chronic sorrow. Okay, so um, let's uh, put a pause there and we'll come back and talk a bit more about um, ambiguous loss after a break. Thank you.